authenticity. That is one of the values. We have six values. And as a pledge to you moms, I am never going to have somebody up here to speak that is not authentic. I hope you see authenticity in me. I hope you saw authenticity in Lori. And today, our very own Nicole Barlow, who is the director of New Ministries at Moms with Swords. That is her current title, but pretty much everything that has happened at Moms with Swords thus far, Nicole has had a hand in. She is, uh, she's a, I can tell her she's a birther. She's a birther. Nicole's like, this idea, this idea, this idea, this idea. So, so much of what has happened at Moms with Swords has been due to her input. So, I am so, so, so grateful for her. She's been, she was one of the original 12. Um, around my dining room table. So um, authenticity just oozes out of Nicole. And so I am so honored that she's coming. How many of you heard her speak last session? It was so powerful. I'm like, okay. So she, she, she told me, she's like, Joy, that the chapter I'm giving, I want it, I want it, I want it. I want it. So she's going to come up here and speak about, uh, about giving. But before she does, I want to pray. And I want to read a verse that the Lord um, arrested my heart with today. It's out of Habakkuk. Habakkuk was a prophet in a not so nice time. And I want you to listen to Habakkuk 3, 19. Because I think there's something in this, even here in these testimonies of these mothers, of what God did through them. The Lord God is my strength. Listen to this. And my personal bravery. And my invincible army. He makes my feet like hinds feet and will make me to walk, not stand still in terror, but to walk and make spiritual progress upon my high places of trouble, suffering, or responsibility. God did that in these moms. And God is doing that through Nicole Barlow. The Lord God is our strength and our personal bravery and our invincible army. Let's pray. God, thank you for this time. Thank you for the testimonies of these mothers, Lord, that have been intentional in the direction as you told Abraham that he would direct the hearts of his children towards you. God, you are telling these moms I have appointed you to direct the hearts of your children towards me. Thank you for the encouragement of these moms that are being intentional, God. May it spur us on. May it not make us feel guilty or, or we didn't do this or we're not doing enough, God. But may it spur us on, God, that that same power, that same bravery, that same army that's surrounding those moms surrounds me, surrounds you. God, you are not a respecter of persons. You give to all. So I pray even with what Nicole shares today, God, that these moms would not wallow in what they're not doing, God, but be motivated to do something. God, you called us to do something. To not sit and soak, but be doers of your word. So I pray as Nicole is authentic in sharing what you have given her, God, that it would activate something in all of us. That you would activate us to move. That you would activate us to action. Knowing that you go before us. You hem us in and you go behind us. God, may we be doers of the word that Nicole puts forth today. And may your presence rest heavily in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Nicole Barlow. As Joy said, I'm one of the original 12 um, and have been on this journey um, with this great group of moms. I love this community of just moms that can spur each other on um, to greatness within ourselves and, and to direct our kids towards the Lord. Um, I, I went to her and she said, okay, I want you to think about what chapter you want to speak on. I said, giving, done. And y'all, I have no idea why I said giving because I'm not a pro at this. This is not my gifting. Um, I just felt like um, this is what the Lord wanted me to speak on. 
And I realized after kind of really digging into the word on this and figuring out what God wanted me to say, a lot of this was because he wanted to work within my family with this stuff. He wanted us to change the way we were doing things. And so I want y'all to hear this as I, as I speak these words. I want you to hear um, the fact that I'm not saying that I do this right because I don't. Um, I believe that this message was for me even more so than it's for any of you. Um, and so I just, I want to kind of put that out there, that this is not me saying I do it right and um, everybody else does it wrong or whatever. This is just me putting it out there, what the Lord has laid on my heart. Um, okay, so I want to start with Matthew six twenty one. Um, And it says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And I want everybody to take a minute and reflect. I want you to think of what you spend the majority of your money on. Treasure in this verse literally means money or goods. So where does the bulk of your money go? Does it go to your kids? Does it go to comfort? Does it go to... um, education, sports? Does it go to productivity and things to make you more efficient? Where does the bulk of your money go? And I want you to write that down. I really want us to reflect on, and you may not know where it goes. You may say, I have no idea where our family money goes. But I want you to think about that right now. Think what's the first thing that comes to your mind that you spend the majority of your money on. By the way, my husband said I needed to add food to that list because that's where the bulk of our money goes. Um, Okay, and then I want you all to hold this spot for Matthew 6.21 because we're going to circle back to this verse. Um, I think it's, it's such a great verse for us to be able to reflect on. Um, that's what we're going to talk about today. Money, stewardship, giving, all the, all the good stuff. I heard Andy Stanley say um, in a video that I watched last week or the week before last that good leaders go first. Um, us as moms, as parents, if we want to lead our kids in a certain direction, we've got to do it first. They've got to see us doing it. They've got to see our example, and that will help them lead them in that direction as well. Um, We have to set the example that we can take on hard things, and and therefore our kids can do hard things, y'all. And money stuff is hard. Like, it's hard. And I'm not a math person, so like you mentioned financial stuff. Andrea, who does all of our financial stuff, she tries to talk to me about finance stuff. I'm like, I don't know. If you try to hand me a check, I'm going to say, give it to Andrea. I got no idea where that's supposed to go, what it's supposed to do. I'm just not, I'm not a money person. It's hard. It's hard to make decisions to turn away from our stuff and turn towards God. It's hard. It's hard. But we have to be willing to do those hard things if we want our kids to go in that direction. Money can be a great resource to help us survive, to help us serve others, to help us take care of our own. But the Bible shows over and over again what a temptation money is. It can steer us off course very, very, very quickly. I want to look at Matthew 19, 16 through 22. It's a story of a rich man. Verse 16 says, Just then a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good, Jesus replied. There is only one that is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones, he inquired. Jesus replied, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. All these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go, sell your possessions, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Y'all, this guy, he did it all right, right? He believed in Jesus. He went to him to ask him what he needed for eternal life. He kept the commandments. He did everything he could in his own power to do what is right. 
But when he was asked to give up his stuff, he walked away. Y'all, I do not want to walk away from Jesus because of my stuff, because I'm attached to my stuff. I don't want my kids to walk away from Jesus because they're attached to their stuff. It's just stuff. I've caught, my times, I've caught myself several times saying things like, God would never send me to live in a mud hut in Africa because I wouldn't have air conditioning, I like my Starbucks, or whatever else like I'm attached to at the moment. But the fact is, is that's me walking away from Jesus because of my stuff. Because in scripture, it's much more in God's character that he's gonna go send me to the mud hut in Africa because it's difficult and because I have to depend on him than he is to keep me in my spot because of my comfort. And so when I close off that opportunity, in my mind, when I close it off and say, I'm not willing to go there, that's me choosing my stuff over following Jesus. Matthew 19 through 20, 23 through 30 goes on to say, then, the, then Jesus said to the disciples, truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Y'all, God knows how hard it is to turn away from our stuff. He's not, he's not naive to that. He knows it's hard to turn away from your comfort. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. We can't turn from our stuff on our own, but with God, with the strength of God, we can turn from our stuff and follow him. Peter answered him, we have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. When I, st- when I first started researching all of this stuff about money and stewardship and wealth, um, I came across something that changed my whole perspective on, in, in the way I was thinking about money. In G- Genesis 13 two, it says that Abram had become wealthy. And it's just one little sentence, right? But I looked up, what the Hebrew word was for the word wealthy that's used there. And every time that it mentions the word wealthy, it doesn't, it doesn't have the same Hebrew word attached to it. But the word that they use here is kabed. The word kabed literally means burdened or weighted down. So why do I look at my money, why do I look at wealth like it's freedom? It's not freedom, y'all. When, when you think about a bigger house, it's more house to clean. It's more to manage. When you think about you have more cars and more this, you have more payments that you're responsible for. It's more. It's not, it's, it doesn't free you up. It straps you down. We are not meant to hold on to more than we need. After that, it becomes a burden and weighs us down. So many times I look at the things that I need and I need, you know, a new kitchen gadget. Y'all, I love kitchen gadgets, even though I don't use them half the time. The newest technology, someone to clean my house, a nanny, the list goes on. The truth is, is that it's all greed. I don't need more. I want. And I, I look at my kids surprised when, when they say, I need this and I need that. They don't need. They want. And they get that from me. I model that greed for them. Um, In the parable of the sower, Jesus talks about um, some seeds that were planted. He says, listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed and he was scattering the seed. Some fell along the path and the birds came and ate it up. 
Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. The disciples asked Jesus to explain the parable. And when Jesus gets to the part about the seed that falls among among thorns, he says this, Still others, like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word out, making it unfruitful. I look at these this parable and stories of messages um, about getting distracted about the, with the desires of this world, y'all, and it puts the fear of God in me. I mean, Jesus says the deceitfulness of wealth and distraction for other things, by other things, makes the living word unfruitful. It has no life. That's scary stuff, y'all, because that's me. I get distracted. I get distracted by all the stuff in the world. Everybody seems to have stuff that makes their life so easy. You know, they have a newer car. They have a, a bigger house with more rooms. They got a special homeschool room and a special this and a special that. And it just, it just consumes you, that want for more. Um. <clears throat> Even though I, it, money is a big, big distraction, there is an opportunity for us to make it an opportunity, a resource versus a distraction and a temptation. At Moms with Swords, we spend, our leadership team spends a lot of time talking about money, and we have from the very beginning. It's very important to us that we spend money towards our mission, The mission and vision of Moms with Swords with Moms with Swords exists to awaken a mother's God-given authority, therefore igniting generations to be faithful followers of Christ. Our mission, our vision directs our spending. If it's not an absolute need that we are trusting God to provide for our ministry, we don't need it. When we spend money on his mission, he will continue to show up and give you more. But it's about us being um, good stewards of what he gives us. Um, we really, we really want to make, and y'all, when I say we don't spend money on stuff that doesn't further our mission, like we don't spend money on it. None of our leaders, none of our leadership team gets paid. They're all volunteers. Some of these volunteers work 20 plus hours a week. They don't do it for the money. They do it because they believe in this mission. Now, there may come a point in the ministry, we do pay the child care workers. There may come a point in the ministry where we have to pay for full-time staff and whatever, I have no idea what God has planned. But right now, he's provided volunteers to work for free. And so that's the route that we go. We want to be faithful to those who donate to the ministry, but more importantly, we want to be faithful to God and how he wants us to spend our money. So what about our personal missions? What about our family missions? Does the way we spend our money as a family reflect our mission? Do we even know what our mission is? And y'all, I love the idea of family mission statements. So if you haven't done that, do that because it's very good directional um, thing for your family. Um, James 2.17 in the voice says, The same is true with faith. Without actions, faith is useless. By itself, it's as good as dead. Without action, my faith means nothing. It's dead useless, of no value. I can't tell my neighbors, my friends, my family, even my kids that I have faith, that I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. But, but my actions and the way that I spend my money does not go along with that faith. 
This, it's not about legalism. It's not a checklist. It's not a certain percentage. It's not about your tithe to your local church, although I wholeheartedly believe in your tithe to your local church. This is about taking everything that you have and giving it up to God, giving it up to the mission that you are on. We are all di given different things and different amounts of money. We all have different resources, but we are called to use that, all that we have for the mission of our ministry. In the parable of the bags of gold, <clears throat> it says, again, it will be like a man going on a journey who has called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one, he gave five bags of gold, to another, two bags, and to another, one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gave five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and, set, and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I know that you are a hard man harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and I went out and I hid your gold in the ground. See, here it is. Here's what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gathered where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. At the end of your life, is God going to say, well done, good and faithful servant? Because you used all that you had to serve him. Does the way you spend your money and resources result in kingdom impact? Sit on that for a second. Does the way you spend your money result in kingdom impact, or does it result in your comfort? We are called to be good stewards. The definition of the word steward is to manage or look after another's property. The, the definition means I am a manager of someone else's stuff. I am merely a manager for the time being. My job, my responsibility is to manage it for the purposes of its owners. It's not mine to use solely on me and my family. Luke 9, 23 through 25 says, And he said to all, If any person wills to come after me, let him deny himself, disown himself, forget, lose sight of himself, and his own interests, refuse and give up himself, and take up his cross daily and follow me. <clears throat> For whoever would preserve his life and save it will lose it and destroy it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will preserve and save it from the penalty of eternal death. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and ruins or forfeits or loses himself? We expect this type of giving. We expect this type of spending from our missionaries, from our pastors, from our ministry leaders, to deny their wants for others, to live on less so that they can live on their mission. But what about you and I? You too are a leader of the church. If you are a follower of Christ, you have been called to lead others to him. So what does our mission look like? What exactly is the mission that we are denying ourselves for? John 20, 21 says, again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. 
As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. The Father is sending us as an extension of Jesus' ministry. We are on the same mission that he was on. Isaiah 61 says, Jesus came to proclaim good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. This, too, is our ministry, to bring hope to those without any. Look how God calls us to fast, the way he calls us to go without food, without comfort for a time, depending solely on him, denying ourselves so that we love others well through our sacrifice. Isaiah 58, 6 through 7 says this, No, this is the kind of fasting that I want. Free those who are wrongly imprisoned. Lighten the burden of those who work for you. Let the oppressed go free and remove the chains that bind people. Share your food with the hungry and give shelter to the homeless. Give clothes to those who need them and do not hide from relatives who need your help. My husband also made me use that version because of the last line, do not hide from your relatives that need your help. Um, When we do this, we give glory to God. This is his heart. This is his heart, y'all. We show people who we are by the way that we love. And there is power in that, power in being obedient to him who has called us. People do not just live below their means without him working inside of them. The the Holy Spirit empowers us to do that. It's only through Jesus Christ in us that we would even be able to consider such a thing. And therein lies our testimony to him and who he is and what he has done for us in our lives. I think we have such a great opportunity in the way that we spend our money. And if we use it in the right way, we set an example that we are different. In Acts 2, 44 through 47, it shows the early church. It says, all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. They acted in faith and they changed the course of history and the kingdom of God forever. Because they put their money where their mouth was and their actions of faith matched their words, other people came to Christ daily. Y'all, what if that happened in our lives? We have that same opportunity. People can come to Christ daily because of the faith that they see in us. We have that same chance to change the world. Our kids have that same chance to change the world. What an amazing opportunity that God has given us through his son, Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit. He has given us plenty so that we can use it to further his kingdom. 2 Corinthians 8, 13 through 15 says, Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard-pressed, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need. So in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. The goal is equality. As it is written, the one who gathered much did not have too much. And the one who gathered little did not have too little. There's plenty of money circulating this world for everybody to be taken care of. The problem is, is when we keep too much of it for ourselves, somebody else goes without. The truth is that most of us here today live in abundance. We are wealthy by the world's standards. 
We have an opportunity to show the world that we are different by the way that we spend our money. Not on worldly goods, but instead on loving others. We can show people who Christ is by taking care of them just as Jesus cared for others. And then maybe the church, y'all, will be seen not as being against everything, but being for people by the way that we love. The greatest commandment is to love God with all of our heart and to love our neighbor as yourself. If you are truly loving those around you and caring for them in the same way that you would care for yourself, we would be raising them up to equality. Y'all, this, this word equality in this verse wrecked me, wrecked me. Because when I give, like if I give away clothes in my house, I give away the outdated stuff that I wouldn't wear anymore. I give away the jeans that are ripped a little bit in the knee that my kids aren't going to wear anymore. I give the stuff I don't want. I'm not raising somebody up to equality. I'm just giving my leftovers. If I'm truly giving out of my plenty, I'm raising a community up to equality so that we all look the same. If we were loving our neighbor like that, then there wouldn't be anybody that was in need. We wouldn't let ourselves go without, right? And so if we're truly loving our neighbor, loving doesn't just mean I'm nice to you and I say hi. If we're loving our neighbors well, like we would love ourselves, we would take care of them. Do you know that there's 10 to 40 million people trapped in slavery today? Many of the goods and services that we use and buy are the ones that keep them there. 750 million people lack clean drinking water. America spends, this is just in America, America spends approximately $20 billion in ice cream a year. For a little more than half of that, we could supply clean drinking water and clean sanitation to the entire world for a year. There are close to 18 million orphans worldwide living in orphanages or on the street. Y'all, those aren't all the orphans. That's just the one that literally have no place to go. I read an article the other day that there are foster kids in Atlanta living in hotel rooms because they have no homes for them. There are schools in our community where 60% of the kids in that school are on free or reduced lunch. What if we started in our community and gave until there was no need, but rather equality? And y'all, that may mean we have to go without some of the stuff that we think we need. What if we looked at the empty bedrooms in our houses that God has given us and used that room to meet the needs of these orphan kids or homeless people that have nowhere to spend the night? What if we forfeited some of our wants so that they could have what they need? What if we truly did love our neighbor well? James 2:14 through 17 says, what good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and you say, goodbye, have a good day, stay warm, and eat well, but then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. Proverbs 24, 12 says, and I think Christy or somebody was talking about this verse earlier, and Heather talked about this on the panel. Um, Proverbs 24, 12 says, don't excuse yourself by saying, look, we didn't know. For God understands all hearts and he sees you. He who guards your soul knows you knew. He will repay all people as their actions deserve. We have a chance to share the gospel. We have an opportunity to bring good news to others. That's the mission that we've been given. 
Let us be intentional about the money and resources that we have and let us spend less so that we can give more. Let us use our houses, our cars, our phones, our computers, every resource that has been entrusted to us. Let us use these things for his mission and give our world hope. 1 Corinthians 4, 1 through 2 says, This then is how you ought to regard us as servants of Christ and, and as those entrusted with the mysteries that God has revealed. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. So let's look back at Matthew six twenty one. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where is your treasure right now? And does it reflect the purpose of your master? Does it reflect the mission of Jesus? Our world is hurting. They are brokenhearted, in captivity, in despair, and living without basic needs. Y'all, we have the answer to all of it. All of it. It's Jesus. The answer to every single thing is Jesus. All we have to do is share it. And we have to be willing to do that. We have to take that first step. Let's pray. <clears throat> God, I thank you so much for this opportunity to be here today and to talk about giving, to talk about the resources that you have given us as a community. Lord, I thank you for all that you have bestowed upon us. Lord, you have given it to us because you know that we will use it in the right way. Jesus, I thank you for your saving grace, God. Jesus, you are the reason that we move forward. We are an extension of your mission. Without your sacrifice, without your death, without your resurrection, without being raised to life, we have nothing. Lord, let us not hold that in, but go out and be doers of your word. Lord, I just thank you so much for this opportunity to gather as women and to spur each other on. Lord, I just thank you for your, your grace, Lord, that you rain down on us every day, that you look not at our past actions, but how we move forward, God. Thank you for this day and for our children and for our families, and let us work towards your mission. In Jesus' name, amen.